This conference will now be recorded. So, um, actually, this lecture is mainly to prepare the, the, uh, the questions, uh, the session of questions and answers and the discussion we, we will have on Friday. So I will start presenting SARS coronavirus 2 and the COVID disease very briefly and mostly in relation with waste management. Then, uh, mainly for those who did not assist, uh, attend the different uh, workshops on waste management, I will give two uh, sessions, which is our really brief summaries of that. The first one is on the principle of biological waste management, and the second is, um, uh, is a focus on autoclaving and incineration, which are the main methods used for biological waste. And then the last uh, session will be an overview of the management options uh, for uh, SARS coronavirus 2 contaminant waste, uh, as well as some uh, a proposal of topics for the next session. But please don't hesitate to ask, quest uh, ask questions to the chat box. Uh, we'll answer some directly if it's directly in connection to, to, to this lecture. And the other uh, uh, questions will be answered ne next time, so on Friday. So uh, the SARS coronavirus, I will go to the first part very quickly because you already the people who followed the, the, the webinars on masks already had this. So COVID is for the disease and SARS coronavirus 2 is for the agent that causes uh, COVID-19. And SARS is for severe acute uh, respiratory syndrome. So actually there are many coronaviruses which are uh, come, uh, present in, 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 in our population and they are quite common in, in, in humans and they cause a common cold. And then there are three more severe infections. Uh, there was the first coronavirus, then the MERS coronavirus in the Middle East, and now this one, which is causing the outbreak and pandemic. One thing that is important to, uh, to know is the, the transmission modes. Actually, transmission is through airborne droplets. So droplets we are part of aerosols, meaning droplets that, st that stays in suspension in the air and can be moved with the air. So the main transmission mode based on, on uh, transmission studies and epidemiology is uh, first direct or close contact. So people live together, who touch each other, who talk to each other very close and so on. In that case, then, uh, there is a high risk of transmission. The second transmission mode is exposure to contaminated sur uh, surfaces. Actually, how does that work? The droplets, they move with the air and finally they settle somewhere they, and, and so they contaminate surfaces. If we touch the, those surfaces with our hands, in that case we can infect ourselves just by touching our nose or our mouth. Then the third, uh, and it's the third in, in, in order I would say, is uh, exposure to aerosol at a distance. Uh, in this case, it's droplets of aerosols that are moved by the air further than that, uh, than the immediate surrounding of the people who, who disseminate the virus. And in that case, uh, there is still a risk of infection. It's a low risk because there is some dilution and also because in the meantime, part of the virus load has disappeared because the virus dies very uh, quite quickly. So in relation to this, the main prevention means are first physical distance. Uh, we should stay at some distance of the people around us as much as possible. The second one uh, with respect to the risk from exposure to contaminated surfaces is cleaning and disinfection. Cleaning and disinfection of surfaces, but also uh, washing hands with soap, which is very important. And then the third me measure is the wearing of masks, and that was uh, the topic of the, of the other webinar. If we think about waste, uh, we need to know about the viability of the virus and also to which it is susceptible, uh, how long can it survive in the environment. Actually, there are a number of data that have already been published on this uh, coronavirus. And for instance, you see that it stays alive for three hours in aerosols, seven hours on stainless steel and so on. This seems to be a lot, especially if you think about 72 hours on stainless steel or plastic. But we have to remember that it's, uh, there is that means it can still be detected after 72 hours. But if you look at the picture on the left-hand side, you see that there is a decrease in the concentration of the virus. Uh, X-axis is the time and uh, the uh, Y-axis is the concentration, but it's a logarithmic scale. So 10 is, uh, is 1, 10, uh, 1 is, is 10, 100, 1,000 and 10,000. 
So what appears more like, like a small curve uh, or, or uh, a line, a straight line there, actually, if we put that in a normal scale, is such a, a, a curve, meaning that very quickly, when it is out of the organism, the virus, part of the virus dies. And so there is a lot of virus that disappears very quickly. And if you, if you see on that graph, after half an hour, uh, after one hour, half of the virus has already disappeared. This is very important to understand, of course. Um, so actually, this is very classical for uh, for most microorganisms, and it's uh, it's a very classical profile or, or uh, a virus which is moderately resistant. Enveloped virus like coronavirus are not the most resistant. There are also some other uh, data on the viability of SARS. Uh, and for instance, it has been established that there is no presence or very uh, low presence of the virus and, and thus of survival in a number of, 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 of type of materials. For, for instance, in stools. In stools, uh, there has been some studies that show that there is some RNA there, but it's due to, to uh, dead virus most of the time. There are only one, uh, one isolation of live virus in stools in the different studies. It's also very, uh, it doesn't survive long uh, in, uh, in blood, for instance. But of course, with blood, you need to take other precautions to avoid other possible blood pathogens. No presence in urine and no survival in water and effluent. So it's interesting to know those data also. Then the, uh, the, the good part is that the, the, the SARS virus is quite sensitive to a number of different physical or chemical agents. So it's sensitive to heat. That means that if we use autoclaving, uh, heat will uh, kill the virus. Also sensitive to UV light, to desiccation, to alcohol, 700% uh, ethanol, for instance, but other alcohols also, uh, sol solutions and gels and so on, to bleach, to acetic acid, to H2O2, and water and soap. So hand washing is very important. So again, this is quite classical, and it's, uh, it shows that the virus is quite uh, susceptible to most, actually, to most uh, physical and chemical agents. If we think more specifically about waste uh, treatment and management in relation to coronavirus too, actually, one thing about the, that, that virus is that it's highly transmissible, and it's potentially a highly pathogenic virus. I say potentially because a number of people get infected but don't show any symptoms or only have quite mild symptoms. And on the other hand of that spectrum, there are people who have very severe disease, but not, not all of them. It's only a small proportion of the people who got infected. Uh, otherwise, the, the virus is quite classical with respect to uh, natural viability and also to resistance and susceptibility profile. So actually, uh, there is no specific issue with respect to waste treatment and management. The coronavirus is, is a virus which is very much, very similar. So uh, I was saying that the, the virus is, is quite similar to a number of other pathogens and no more resistant than that. So uh, that means that if you already have a waste management system, that take care of other biological waste in a satisfying manner, there is no, no more issue, specific issue with, with coronavirus. So a, if a good system is already in place, you just need to treat those waste as, uh, that contain coronavirus as other biological waste. If it's not the case, then you should probably do some segregation and apply some specific treatment. And that will probably be uh, the object of most of the questions that we will deal with. So um, this is uh, this is time for some questions, but uh, Zia will, will first uh, make a summary of, of this uh, few slides in, in, in Urdu. Zia, if you are ready. Uh, yes, welcome, Michal. Thank you, Zia. So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 
आज का जो हमारा सेशन था ये वेस्ट मैनेजमेंट के मुतालिक है कोरोना वायरस के लिहाज से वेस्ट को हम कैसे मैनेज कर सकते हैं ये भी डिस्कस इसमें किया जाएगा सो so, जिस तरह से फिलीप स्ट्रू ने बताया आपको कि जो कोरोना वायरस डिजीज है उसको कोविड कहते हैं और जो एजेंट जो इसको काज करता है उसका नाम सार्स सी है हम इस वायरस से पहली दफा इन्फेक्ट नहीं हुए आल दो इस स्ट्रेन से पहली दफा इफेक्ट हुए हैं इस कोरोना वायरस से हम इससे पहले भी इफेक्ट होते रहे हैं जो इसकी पेंडेमिक्स की डिटेल आपकी स्क्रीन पे शेयर हो रही है हवा आमतौर पे यह हवा में मौजूद जो हमारे मुंह से निकलने हुए निकलते हुए पानी के जरात है उसे ट्रांसमिट होता है और फिजिकल डिस्टेंसिंग और सोप और वाटर के साथ हम इससे बच भी सकते हैं ये वायरस किसी भी सतह पर मुख्तलिफ तरह की सतहों पर तीन घंटे से लेकर तीन दिन यानी कि बहत्तर आज तक जो मुख्तलिफ स्टडीज की गई हैं कि ये जिंदा रह सकता है या वहाँ पे सरवाइव कर सकता है और उसका आर एन ए डिटेक्ट हुआ है लेकिन जिस तरह से आज साथ आपके राइट हैंड साइड पे जो कर्व दिखाई गई है कि ये इसका डिके बड़ी जल्दी होती है जो कापीज हैं इसकी बड़ी जल्दी से कम होना शुरू हो जाती हैं जो बाकी स्टडीज की गई हैं स्टूल और ब्लड और जो दूसरे सैंपल्स हैं बॉडी फ्लूड्स हैं उसमें इसकी मकदार बहुत कम पाई गई है या निगलीजिबल पाई गई है मतलब बहुत ज्यादा जो इसकी मकदार है वो उसमें हमें नहीं मिली अच्छा ये वायरस जब सरफेस पे हो या जिसमें से बाहर हो तो बड़ा हसास होता है और हीट या जो दूसरे सारे केमिकल्स हैं जो यहाँ पे इन्वेस्ट भी किए गए हैं उनसे बड़ी आसानी के साथ इसको किल किया जा सकता है अब बात आती है स्पेसिफिक टू वेस्ट ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ सार्स कोरोना वायरस अगर आपके पास एक रूटीन में एक अच्छा बायोलॉजिकल वेस्ट सिस्टम मैनेजमेंट सिस्टम आपके पास इन प्लेस है तो आप जो कोरोना वायरस से पैदा हुआ होने वाला वेस्ट है उसको भी उसी तरह से उसके साथ ही बायोलॉजिकल वेस्ट के तौर पर मैनेज कर सकते हैं अगर खुदा नास्ता आपके पास प्रॉपर वेस्ट मैनेजमेंट सिस्टम नहीं है तो उसके लिए फिर हमें सार्स कोरोना वायरस के लिए स्पेशल ट्रीटमेंट ऑप्शन जेरे गौर करनी पड़ेंगी जो आगे हम डिस्कस करेंगे यहाँ तक कोई भी सवाल हो आपका तो चैट बॉक्स इस्तेमाल करते हुए आप सवाल पूछ सकते हैं थैंक यू थैंक यू जिया थैंक यू एवरीबॉडी दिस इज डॉक्टर जीबा फ्रॉम फोगड़ी इंटरनेशनल सेंटर आई एम सॉरी आई हैड सम टेक्निकल प्रॉब्लम्स गेटिंग ऑन एट द बिगिनिंग वी डू हैव सेवरल क्वेश्चंस एंड आई एम ग्लैड एट प्लीज कंटिन्यू योर क्वेश्चंस नाउ द फर्स्ट वन इज do we autoclave waste of covid uh, a covid-19 pcr lab and do we do it inside or outside the lab uh, how and then there's several more related to waste of a covid-19 pcr lab um i don't know if you'd like to take the questions like how to neutralize the liquid waste where it can be drained into sewerage uh, in a specific area how about microwave shredders uh is it and then is it a sexually transmitted disease uh, transferred by body fluids or blood uh, what is the percentage of household bleach for disinfection i know you're going to get into some of these later on philip but if there are any you'd like to take please go ahead yeah perhaps since now we spoke about the virus i will answer the question about a uh, possible std transmission uh actually um it's the first time i see that so all the data i've seen were showing that it was there was no survival in blood it's only very transient in blood and there is no survival there and i didn't see anything about any possible sexual trans, uh, transmission so uh, i'm i'm a little bit surprised uh, about that uh, that saying but i would be curious to know more about this uh to my knowledge there it's not an issue but we don't know uh we we also need to be careful with some some information sometimes there are some information that are a little bit kind of uh, frightening and there is no no good support behind that but if the person who asked the question has some some reference to that i would be interested to to get it and also to to look at that more closely um for the rest of the questions uh, i think that uh, some answers will be brought in the presentation and if not in that case i will answer later and so i propose to to go to the next session if you if okay go ahead okay um i'm blocked 
Okay. So, as I said, uh, this uh, section is uh, on uh, the biological waste management principle, and it's really a summary of the main uh, of the main picture from from the the, the three day workshop that we we had with some of you. So, uh, for that workshop, we used a model uh, which is a, a, a general model, but which is very useful to understand that waste management is not just what we do in hospitals and in, uh, in, uh, and in institu institutions. It, it's it's a, a very complex and, 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 and complete process. So actually the waste are generated in the labs or in the hospitals and there they are segregated. We put them in different waste bags or containers and so on and packed uh, in a way that allows further treatment, for instance. And that's really done in the hospital units and in the laboratories. Then those wastes uh, are taken from the labs and, and transported on the site and stored temporarily in some place and possibly also treated uh, in the labs or in the institution. Uh, it could be the main principle. Uh, it's through autoclaving, we see a picture there, or through uh, incineration. Uh, wave treatment, uh, microwave treatment is also a very good treatment for uh, biological waste. Then once uh, once that has been done, then there is collection and offsite transportation. So you see here collection and uh, and, and some uh, some uh, truck for uh, transport of, of biological waste to a final treatment or disposal site. Disposal is classically landfills, and some of them are controlled, some others are not. And if there is some final treatment, generally it's through uh, again through incineration. So it's very important to understand that because uh, to, to look at the whole picture, because sometimes if, uh, if we want to modify things in the laboratory, we need to take into account, into consideration, what is done with the waste after that. Similarly, the people who collect and transport uh, the waste, they need to know what is done in the lab, to know if uh, this, the, the waste is still hazardous or not. So if we look at, the, at that picture and thinking about risk, during the first phase in the laboratory and in the institution, the main risk is clearly the personal exposure. So the exposure of the laboratory staff or the uh, hospital staff. Those people, they are trained, uh, they are well educated, they know about biological risk, about biological agents and so on, and they are protected. They have some, uh, some personal protection. So I would say that that, that risk is, mo is more or less and, and generally more than it's quite well done uh, in, in a good situation and they, 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 there is a good control of risk. But once the waste leaves the site, uh, they are more and more in contact with other people. And so there is still a risk for the, for the staff, but also a risk for the community and the environment. And in that case, for instance, the, 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 the staff may not be as, uh, as educated and not be protected. If you think about waste handlers, they don't have a, most of the time a, a very high level of education and they don't know biological risk, for instance. And so it's important to understand that in that, in that case, those people could be exposed, but also the community, starting with the people they, they live with and so on, and also the envir environment. For instance, in case of an, uh, an accident, a road accident, for instance, uh, the people, the rescuers, the environment could be exposed. And so this is the, especially the case if the bio-waste is not managed well, uh, well from the start. Okay, so actually, uh, if we look and that there are two uh, different options either in the labs or uh, on, on the laboratory or hospital side we treat the waste so that it's not hazardous anymore and then all the downstream becomes very safe or it's not possible or we don't have enough means to do it properly and in that case we need to take uh, care of, of all uh, the, the downstream process so basically there are two main strategies that can be used for, uh, for to manage biological waste the first one is on-site treatment. So the principle there is to treat hazardous waste on the site to make further handling and disposal safe. The basic need for that, we need to have a very efficient and reliable decontamination treatment. Okay. If we have that, then it, it will facilitate the rest. So theoretically, it's the safest way to proceed. And also it's the most recommended strategy uh, for instance, if we look at WHO recommendations or uh, countries that have a regulation, the, the general requirement is to treat the waste as soon as, 
as their source, as possible as uh, of their source. Sorry. The second uh, strategy is off-site treatment. In this case, the, prin the principle is to secure the whole waste handling process so from the start to the end and treat the waste as a final step. The need there is to have safe handling and transport and final uh, uh, measures, so safe handling and transport, and also a good final treatment capacity. In practice, it's not the most recommended, but actually in practice, it's possibly, it can be very safe and, and a very sustainable strategy, and it is used in, in many countries actually. So the, the options for hospital and laboratory waste treatment, uh, first on-site treatment, and then there are a number of different options, but for solid waste, it's autoclaving, uh, which is the most used, I would say, worldwide. Microwave treatment, which is a new treatment. It's also, uh, in that case, the wastes are uh, shred and then treated with microwave in pre presence of humidity, which is very effective also. And then incineration, on-site incineration or possibly burning. The difference we make between burning and incineration, burning is just let things burn, so there is no control of, of anything, temperature and so on, while incineration, it's a controlled process where we, we reach a, a, a given uh, a, a standard temperature. Then for liquid waste, there are also different options, I put the main ones there. Treating with bleach, that's one, one, one way to do, which is very much done in laboratories, for instance, or other, other possible uh, chemicals that can be used on liquids, for instance, uh, oxygen peroxide, H2O2. Then there are also some thermal treatment, autoclaving again, but also boiling. And then incineration, but incineration of liquid waste, mostly, most, uh, at least on, on small incinerator, must be done together with some solid. So it's a mixture of solid and li liquids in that case. Then if we look at off-site treatment, uh, the most used, and that's also worldwide, is incineration. If we compare the two strategies with respect to their uh, advantages and, uh, and drawback, uh, on-site treatment is as advantage, first advantage is that the, it's the most recommended strategy. That means that uh, it will be well accepted by most regulators. Also, the decontamination is under the responsibility of the waste generator, of the people who generate the waste and who generally know the waste very well. Uh, if it's fin final treatment, those people are not aware of laboratory hospital activities, for instance. In this case, the people who know the best, they do the treatment. Also, uh, all the downstream process becomes safer. It's a safer collection, transport, and final disposal. So all that is easier, and that makes it also, uh, in principle, uh, less expensive. It's less expensive to collect, to transport, and dispose of. Uh, with respect to the cost of packaging or packing, uh, that's a little bit, uh, it's not so clear, because for instance, if you autoclave waste, in that case, you need specific bags, which are more expensive than normal bags. The drawbacks of this approach is uh, that uh, the equipment that are needed to treat waste, like autoclaves, uh, uh, microwave shredders, incinerators, and so on, they are quite expensive to, uh, to purchase, but also quite expensive to operate. Uh, microwave treatment is less expensive on, on, on use. In Pakistan, also, there are few suitable autoclaves. There are many autoclaves that are too basic or, and not fully equipped to really treat waste. And I will give some more explanation about that later. And also, and that's quite general, there is no proper validation of the inactivation of the killing process, I would say. And then the main disadvantage is that if the treatment is not well done and not reliable, in that case, uh, the, we still need to, to have some protection for the downstream process. So that means that if you are not totally sure that on-site treatment strategy works, in that case, we still need to take precautions. Uh, now the off-site treatment strategy. So, so uh, the advantage of that it's not innovation. <laughs> Um, 
is that it's done by incineration, and incineration is a very safe and very sustainable uh, way to, to, to do final treatment. It's much safer, for instance, and more sustainable than landfill disposal. Also, uh, one advantage for the authorities is that central treatment is much more easy to control. It's much easier for a provincial authority or a national authority, for instance, to, uh, to have an eye and control one or two major incinerator than rather than having to, to control 25 incinerators and, and perhaps hundreds of, of autoclaves. Also, uh, in practice, it reveals uh, it, it, it is actually uh, often more uh, viable from an economical point of view and more sustainable if well managed because there is a, a, an economy of scale there. It's less expensive to operate one large oper uh, incinerator than for instance, 20 small ones. The drawbacks is that uh, if we use that strategy, we need to secure the whole process from collection to final treatment. So that generates some cost also. Also, a central incinerator should be a sophisticated incinerator. And so there are, there is, it's quite expensive and also uh, expensive to, to operate. Then there are some environmental issues, uh, depending on the type of, more or less important, depending on the, the type of incinerator, and also some perception issues, like the neighborhood will not like having an incinerator nearby. Uh, so incinerators should not be placed close to a, to a city or a town, for instance. Also in Pakistan, except uh, locally, there is, uh, there is no real good central treatment capacity. So again, we're ready for a summary and, and some questions, uh, Zia. So, जो ये प्रोसेस आपके सामने शो किया गया है एक डायग्राम में आमतौर पर ये बायोलॉजिकल वेस्ट को मैनेज करने के लिए एक अच्छा मॉडल है और ये बड़ी आसानी से अडॉप्ट किया जा सकता है इसमें सबसे पहले आता है वेस्ट की पैकेजिंग सेग्रीगेशन और पैकेजिंग ये ऑन साइट होती है मतलब जहां पे वेस्ट प्रोड्यूस हो रहा है वहां पे होगी इसके बाद जो नेक्स्ट स्टेप आता है वो है वेस्ट की ऑन साइट ट्रांसपोर्ट या उसकी स्टोरेज और ट्रीटमेंट ऑन साइट जो उसके बाद आता है हमारा ऑफ साइट कलेक्शन और ट्रांसपोर्टेशन और उसके बाद फाइनल ट्रीटमेंट जो ऑन साइट वेस्ट की मैनेजमेंट की ऑप्शन है यहाँ पर जो पर्सन उसको डायरेक्टली डील कर रहे होते हैं वर्कर्स वो एट रिस्क हो सकते हैं अगर इस चीज को प्रॉपरली अडॉप्ट ना किया जा सके और जब ऑफ साइट उसकी कलेक्शन ट्रांसपोर्ट और फाइनल ट्रीटमेंट के लिए हम इस वेस्ट को भेजते हैं तो वहां पर कम्युनिटी और एनवायरमेंट और जो पर्सन उसको डील कर रहे होते हैं वो तीनों ऑन रिस्क हो सकते हैं अगर इस प्रोसेस को प्रॉपरली अडॉप्ट ना किया जाए अच्छा यहाँ पर दो स्ट्रेटजीज आती है वेस्ट को मैनेज करने की ऑन साइट मतलब वेस्ट जहां पे प्रोड्यूस हो रहा है वहां पे हम इसको उसको मैनेज करें और दूसरी आती है ऑफ साइट की ऑन साइट में वेस्ट को उसकी प्रोडक्शन की जगह पर ही ट्रीट किया जाता है और ऑफ साइट में उस वेस्ट को जो प्रोड्यूस हुआ है उसको ले जाकर हम किसी और जगह ट्रांसपोर्ट करके फाइनल ट्रीटमेंट करते हैं जहां पर हमारे पास फैसिलिटी अवेलेबल हो ऑन साइट ट्रीटमेंट में हमारे पास सॉलिड वेस्ट के लिए ऑटो क्लेविंग और माइक्रोवेव की ऑप्शंस अवेलेबल हैं और अगर हमने लिक्विड का वेस्ट ट्रीट करना है तो उसमें हमारे पास मुख्तलिफ केमिकल है फॉर एग्जाम्पल ब्लीच हम उसको यूज कर सकते हैं और ऑफ साइट पे आमतौर पर इंसिनरेटर की फेसिलिटी यूज की जाती है बर्निंग और इंसिनरेशन में फर्क यह है कि बर्निंग अनकंट्रोल्ड होती है उसका टेम्परेचर कंट्रोल नहीं होता जो इंसिनरेशन है वो कंट्रोल्ड टेम्परेचर पे होती है जो ऑन साइट ट्रीटमेंट स्ट्रेटजी है वो निस्पतन बेहतर है इसलिए कि बिफोर कलेक्शन एंड ट्रांसपोर्ट ऑफ वेस्ट हम उसको ट्रीट कर लेते हैं और वो डेंजरस नहीं रहता एज कंपेयर टू नॉन ट्रीटेड वेस्ट और दूसरा यह है कि ये डब्ल्यू और बाकी जो ऑर्गेनाइजेशन है वो इसको रिकमेंड uh, भी करती है और ये एक सेफर मैथड है एज कंपेयर टू ऑफ साइट लेकिन इसका नुकसान यह है कि इसमें ऑपरेशनल और मेंटेनेंस कॉस्ट जो हमारे ऑन साइट ट्रीटमेंट के लिए है वो ज्यादा इन्वॉल्व है और पाकिस्तान में जो ऑटो क्लेव अवेलेबल है उनकी प्रॉपर वैलिडेशन या प्रॉपर ऑटो क्लेव जो कम्प्लेक्स वेस्ट के लिए होने चाहिए वो अवेलेबल हमें नहीं है 
ऑफ साइड ट्रीटमेंट में आमतौर पर जिस तरह आपने डिस्कस किया कि इंसिनरेशन आमतौर पर यूज की जाती है ये एक सस्टेनेबल है और बेटर है एज कम्पेयर टू लैंड और इसमें एक सेंट्रल uh, क्योंकि ये ट्रीटमेंट फैसिलिटी है ये कंट्रोल बाई अथॉरिटी होती है लाइसेंसिंग होती है इसकी के इन्वायरमेंट और बाकी सारे हैजर्ड इसके लाइसेंस होते हैं कि कोई चीज आउट ऑफ द कंट्रोल या आउट ऑफ द वे ना हो इसके भी नुकसान ये है कि जो होल प्रोसेस है वो पूरा हमें सिक्योर करने की जरूरत है क्योंकि हम ऑन साइड ट्रीट नहीं कर रहे हम ऑफ साइड ट्रांसपोर्ट कर रहे हैं वेस्ट को मैनेज करने के लिए तो जो पूरा प्रोसेस है वो सिक्योर होना चाहिए ताकि जो रस्ते में ट्रांसपोर्टेशन के दौरान कोई भी लीकेज या कोई भी ऐसी चीज ना हो जिससे इन्फेक्शन काज हो सके जो इस इसकी स्टार्टअप कास्ट है ऑपरेशनल कास्ट है डेफिनेटली एक इंसिनरेटर की वो हाई है लेकिन एक सेंट्रल फैसिलिटी है वो मल्टी फैसिलिटी से वेस्ट को लेकर उसको मैनेज करते हैं इसलिए वो निस्बतन बेहतर रह जाता है बाकी रहे इसके कुछ थोड़े बहुत इन्वायरमेंटल कंसर्न भी होते हैं अगर इस जो वेस्ट जो इंसिनरेटर है वो प्रॉपरली मैनेज ना हो तो उसके इन्वायरमेंटल कंसर्न हो सकते हैं यहाँ तक जो भी क्वेश्चन हो काइंडली चैट बॉक्स में आप पूछ सकते हैं थैंक यू थैंक यू वी हैव लॉट्स ऑफ क्वेश्चंस रिलेटेड टू दिस फिलिप आई थिंक यू सीन द अर्लियर वंस ऑन स्पेशल रिक्वायरमेंट्स फॉर डिस्पोजल ऑफ फेस मास्क एंड रबर ग्लव्स ऑटोक्लेविंग वेस्ट ऑफ पीसीआर लैब इनसाइड और आउटसाइड द लैब न्यूट्रलाइजिंग लिक्विड वेस्ट ऑफ अ पीसीआर लैब Uh, can we drain it into sewerage anywhere or do we have to have a specific area can we use microwave shredders to dispose of liquid waste or only incinerate it um and then there's a whole series more uh that are there so i don't know uh, if you would like to continue with your presentation or answer any of these uh yeah i, I said okay oh Oops. It's uh, the many questions, and and thank you for for those questions. I th I think we we can move on because uh, there will be more elements that will be brought afterward. One thing I can already say is, is with, uh, with respect to the to the different techniques that were mentioned, like autoclaving, uh, like uh, bleaching, for instance, like uh, microwave treatment. Those are very good treatment. Uh, good. Treatment if you have the appropriate materials, uh, and in that case, of course, they also apply to COVID contaminated waste. But I will speak a little bit, uh, and it's very true for bleaching. Bleaching is very efficient. It's very true also for the microwave treatment after shredding. So that's extremely efficient, and and it works very well. Uh, the next session is mostly about autoclaving, and we'll see that there there, there might be some some more issues with respect to autoclaving. So I propose to move to that uh, section now. So uh, actually, uh, autoclaving is the sterilization or the decontamination. Uh, it's a process that uses saturated and pressurized uh, water vapor as biological inactivation means. So it's uh, it seems to be very simple, and uh, an autoclave is also called uh, called a steam, steam sterilizer. We use the autoclave in some cases to generate the pressure vapor if we don't have vapor that is injected into the chamber, and also mainly to hold the, the, the vapor during the tre treatment. We, we need to keep it at, at the right pressure for all the duration, duration of the treatment. So that's really what we define when, when what how we define uh, autoclaving. So sterilization of decontamination process using saturated vapor under pressure. The most usual sterilization, and I, I say sterilization standard, is 121 degrees for 15 minutes. So that's what is recommended by WHO to, to sterilize uh, equipment, in, uh, in, including uh, surgical instruments and so on. One thing which is very important to know, uh, to, to know and understand is that the principle of uh, bacterial uh, or viral inactivation uh, when autoclaving is really the contact with steam. So it's not just heat, we need the contact between the steam and the microorganism. And actually we, we use the pressure to increase, to be able to work at a temperature higher than 100 degrees, but also to, stay, to, to facilitate steam penetration inside of the waste bags, for instance, inside of the, of the microorganism. Um, and so the heat itself is a, a, second, a secondary principle, but the main uh, uh, 
active principle, I would say, is the contact with steam. So uh, because of that, autoclaving is considered a moist heat treatment. And see, you see that, for instance, with uh, autoclaving, uh, we have a good inactivation um, at uh, using autoclaving for 121 degrees during uh, 15 minute, uh, minutes or 134 min uh, degrees for three minutes. Okay. If we compare with a dry heat treatment, so there is no steam, it's just temperature, like in an oven, for instance. In that case, we need to reach much higher temperature, like 160 degrees for two or three hours, or 200 degrees for one or two hours. So you see that it's, it's much less effective. We need higher temperature and much more time. About sterilization and waste decontamination. If you look at the two pictures on the on the left hand side, you see that sterilizing equipment is quite easy. If you have equipment like that, make uh, just put like that on some trays and so on, it's very easy for the re, uh, for the uh, the steam to to cover everything and to reach everything and thus to kill every mi microorganism there. On the other hand, if you have waste bags, uh, possibly double waste bags and so on, which are closed and so on, it will be much more difficult for the steam to penetrate the bags and to reach all single items which are inside of the bag. So actually, uh, decontamination of, of complex loads like waste bags is much, much more difficult than, uh, to achieve than sterilization because the steam has, diff has some difficulties to penetrate the bags and to reach everything inside of the bags. If we look at the different types of autoclaves that exist, there are many different types. Of course, they look different, and the most basic ones are on the left, the most sophisticated one on the right, but they also have different characteristics. Some use a uh, pulse of, of negative pressure and so on and so on, so there are different characteristics. And some of them are only for sterilization, and some of them uh, are more or less good for waste decontamination. If we look also uh, at the bags, there are very different qualities of the bags. Some bags really let really the, the, uh, uh, the steam penetrate into the bags when they are at a high temperature, while some others, they don't allow the steam to penetrate. And so depending on the type of autoclave, depending on the type of uh, waste bag, depending on the, on, on the, the items which are inside, the, 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 the size of the bags and so on, you, you might have very different results when, when you autoclave waste, for instance. So not all the autoclaves are suitable, but not all the, 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 the bags are suitable. And so in some cases, uh, autoclaving a waste uh, does not produce good results. The problem is that most of the time, the, the efficacy of the inactivation process is not validated. So we don't, we perhaps we use some bioindicators and so on, but outside of the bag. So we still don't know what happens inside the bag. So there is, there is an issue at that level. When autoclaving, if the autoclave is not appropriate, if the bags are not appropriate, if it's not validated, we are not sure that it is inactivated. On-site incinerators, um, the picture you see on the uh, on the right, uh, they, are, they were taken uh, in Gilgit, Pakistan, so in Pakistan, and you see those uh, are two small incinerators uh, located on site, uh, but outside of the of the buildings, I would say. Uh, they can be uh, the source of energy can be diverse. In some cases, you can even use wood if you don't find anything else. Uh, and so there is a good combustion of, of the waste, but most of the time not at the, the most effective temperature. Normally it should be above a thousand degrees. Uh, it's often between 650 or uh, 900 degrees. The result of that is that we have ashes like at the, on the bottom picture, which are not completely burned. If it's above 1,000 degrees or 1,100 degrees, in that case, it will be completely uh, destroyed. It will be real ash. In this case, you could still find some pieces of metal or, or, or glass, sorry, or, or glass. Still, I, I, it's not a major concern, I would say, because everything is totally killed. There is nothing living there. You don't even need to decontaminate there. When you are at temperature like even 600 degrees, it's it's uh, 10 times more than what would be required to kill most microorganisms. So it's very efficient in killing bacteria, viruses, and so on. 
So if we have incineration as on-site treatment, uh, the, the, the main advantage is the complete inactivation, a complete killing of all biological agents or, or material. You don't have to, 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 to care about, bio, about biological risk after that. It's completely gone. Also, it's possible to treat various types of waste, including some chemicals. Also, uh, all the, the waste will be completely, completely destroyed. That means that it, the volume will be reduced. So if you, for instance, if you uh, incinerate uh, 10 cubic meters of, 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 of waste, you will end up with a few, uh, few kilograms of ashes. So it's, it's much more, it's much easier to transport and dispose after that. So it's, uh, so it's also from that point of view, less, less expensive. And it's quite convenient. It's e easier in some way to operate than uh, than some uh, other uh, more complex uh, equipment like uh, autoclaves. The main drawbacks: it's uh, it's it costs a lot, including in operating costs, including in maintenance, and that's a, a problem for many institutions. And also, there are, there is that environmental and public perception issue. Central bio waste incineration, in that case, uh, since it will replace a number of small incinerators, it's possible to have very nice facilities which can be very well maintained. This picture was, this picture was taken in Brunei, uh, so, uh, and, and in that case, they had, I would say, a very good facility. Instead of having a very big incinerator, they decided to have two middle size, uh, mid medium size incinerator, which is very good for. Uh, for operation, they can operate one and then the other and so on. And if one is broken or in maintenance, they can still use it. So this kind, this kind of facility also is uh, it, it can be very effective in uh, not only in treating waste but also from an economical point of view. Any questions uh, after the summary? Zia? Yes. Okay, thank you. The third section will focus more on autoclaving. Autoclaving is the process that is used with pressure to be used with pressure to achieve the sterilization process. And this process is used to be achieved in 121 degrees in 15 minutes. Okay, so now we जो इसका इनएक्टिवेशन करने का प्रिंसिपल है कि ऑटो क्लेविंग किस तरह से वेस्ट को इनएक्टिवेट करता है तो जो स्टीम है उसका वेस्ट के साथ कांटेक्ट होना जरूरी है और जो प्रेशर है वो इस चीज को फैसिलिटेट करता है जो स्टीम है वो वेस्ट के अंदर तक जाए और वेस्ट को डीकंटामिनेट कर सके आमतौर पे जिस तरह हमने पहले भी डिस्कस किया कि 121 डिग्री पे 15 मिनट का ये प्रोसेस है लेकिन अगर आपने यही काम जल्दी करना है तो 134 डिग्री पे 3 मिनट में भी सेम प्रोसेस हम अचीव कर सकते हैं in case that we don't have auto cleaving facility, we want dry heat to use dry heat, so the process that we have achieved with auto cleaving, we can dry heat from dry heat, but for that, we will be in 160 degrees, and in 200 degrees, we will be in 1 to 2 hours, so that we can decontaminate the waste. Now, there is a little bit of comparison, जो आम स्टेरिलाइज्ड जो आम इक्विपमेंट्स हैं सर्जिकल इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स हैं उनको अगर हमने स्टेरिलाइज करना है और वेस्ट को डीकंटामिनेट करना है तो इन दोनों में से जो इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स हैं उनको स्टेरिलाइज करना आसान है क्योंकि उन पे डायरेक्टली जो है वो स्टीम इन कांटेक्ट होगी जो वेस्ट है उसमें बैग के अंदर हमारी स्टीम का पेनिट्रेट करना जरूरी है तो जो मिक्स वेस्ट है वो फार मोर डिफिकल्ट है टू स्टेरिलाइज और डीकंटामिनेट एज कंपेयर टू रूटीन सर्जिकल इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स ये कुछ पिक्चर्स हैं लेफ्ट से राइट सिंपल से ज्यादा कॉम्प्लिकेटेड की तरफ है ऑटो क्लेव की और साथ में कुछ वेस्ट बैग्स की हैं ये डिपेक्ट करती हैं कि जो सारे ऑटो क्लेव हैं या सारे ऑटो क्लेव बैग हैं वो हर किस्म के वेस्ट को या हर तरह के ट्रीटमेंट के लिए सूटेबल नहीं है स्पेसिफिक बैग्स हैं जो वेस्ट को डिकॉन्टेमिनेट करने के लिए इस्तेमाल होते हैं और वही ऐसे ऐसे बैग्स होने चाहिए जो स्टीम को पेनिट्रेट करने की इजाजत देते हो अब इसके बाद बात आती है ऑन साइट इंसिनरेटर की जो ऑन साइट इंसिनरेटर होंगे आमतौर पर वो छोटी कैपेसिटी के होंगे और बेसिक होंगे और वो किसी भी सोर्स ऑफ एनर्जी से चल सकते हैं उनमें दो तरह की कंबस्टन हो सकती है प्राइमरी जो सिंगल कंबस्टन या हो सकता है कि अगर जो बेहतर क्वालिटी के इंसिनरेटर है उनमें सेकेंडरी कंबस्टन भी हो ताकि जो फ्यूम्स पैदा हो रहे हैं उनको भी बंद किया जा सके 
इनकी जो टेम्परेचर रेंज है वो सिक्स फिफ्टी टू नाइन हंड्रेड डिग्री तक वेरी करती है लेकिन ये कंप्लीट बायोलॉजिकल इन एक्टिवेशन के लिए इनफ है जो इंसिनरेशन ऑन साइट हम की जाती है उसके कुछ फायदे और नुकसान हम डिस्कस कर लेते हैं कि इससे इंसिनरेशन से ऑलवेज हम कंप्लीट बायोलॉजिकल इन एक्टिवेशन अचीव कर सकते हैं इससे कंप्लीट डिस्ट्रक्शन हो जाएगी जो भी बायोलॉजिकल एजेंट्स है और वॉल्यूम ड्रेस्टिकली कम हो जाएगा जो एशिज की शक्ल में रह जाएगा लेकिन इसका ड्रॉबैक यह है कि इसकी जो इन्वायरमेंटल इफेक्ट्स हैं वो हैं और दूसरा यह है कि इसको मेंटेन और स्टार्ट करने की जो कॉस्ट है वो काफी ज्यादा है ये एक पिक्चर ली गई है ब्रुनाई दारुल इस्लाम से फिलिप स्टूट की जो वन ऑफ द फेवरेट इंसिनरेटर है ये एक सेंट्रल इंसिनरेटरिंग फैसिलिटी की पिक्चर है जो एक बड़ा हाईली मेंटेन और स्टेट ऑफ द आर्ट इंस्ट्रूमेंट है यहाँ तक जो भी सवाल है आप चैट बॉक्स में हमसे पूछ सकते हैं थैंक यू वेरी मच so there have been lots and lots of questions thank you zia and uh, philip uh, my suggestion is that since we only have about 10 minutes left we go ahead and complete the presentation because we will have a whole session on questions and answers on friday so uh, unless philip you would like to take on some of these right now uh no i, I think we we can move on and i will already answer some of the question in this uh, session uh, mainly in the first slide over here So uh, now we really kind of prepare the next uh, se uh, the next session on Friday uh, that will be uh, discussing and, and also answering all those questions. Uh, actually, first the type of, of concerned activities and waste. If we think about lab laboratories, uh, the waste that should be, uh, of course, we, sp we speak about lab laboratories in which the COVID uh, coronavirus is used, of course, or Uh, materials are there. So all the sampling swabs, tips, tubes, and all possible disposable items in contact with potentially contaminated samples or virus isolate have to be considered as contaminated and, and treated as such. Also, all the use of personal protective equipment, such as gloves, masks, and so on, and other disposable PPE. So for instance, if you have disposable uh, gowning and so on, all that also needs to be treated as infectious waste and thus decontaminated. And of course, all uh, lab waste in, in case of viral culture. So if you do viral culture, which is normally done in a BSL treat, in that case, all that of course should be should be uh, eliminated. But the principle in a BSL three lab is that all wastes are immediately treated when they go out of the lab. In relation to lab, there were quite a lot of questions about PCR. So PCR uh, is is a, a, a process that has different steps. The first step, we have the materials which are infected, and from that we uh, extract the nucleic acid. In this case, it's RNA. Okay, and then we take just the RNA, not the virus. We take the RNA and we do uh, we do some amplification. There is another part of the process which is the preparation of the premix and so on that we use also in in the reading and uh, amplification and reading. Actually, if you look at that process in three three steps: uh, extraction, um, preparation, and then amplification and reading, uh, only the first step we have a risk of infection. Normally, the best way to proceed with PCR is to have the three steps in different rooms. In that case, only the room, only the waste from the inactivation room need to be considered as infected. And then uh, thus decontaminated, treated. Okay, but the rest of the PCR process, like the the the, the waste from the prepare, preparation room and from the amplification and the reading rooms, they they are not biological waste anymore, so they don't need to be treated. I hope that this clarifies uh, the situation. If not, ask more questions about that. Of course, if you have do all the PCR in the same room, which is not recommended, in that case, it's It might be better to consider all those waste as contaminated and thus think about treatment. Okay. So activities in the healthcare sector and hospitals, uh, without their labs, of course, all the samplings, are all disposable items in contact with the samples. So that's the same thing as in labs. Also, all the disposable used in or in contact with patient and suspected cases. Uh, so it's, for instance, if you have some disposable. Uh, Plates and so on for uh, to to feed them. 
all the, the, the medical material that is in contact with them uh, and so on, all that is contaminated and should be considered, if it's disposable, should be considered as waste. And of course, as for laboratories, uh, all PPEs, including gloves and masks and so on. So, um, there are three main uh, possibilities with respect to the management system and thinking about COVID. Uh, the, first, the first case, uh, let's say that you have a suitable bio-waste management system in place. You, are, you have a nice institution, you already have a management system in place, you are satisfied the way it works and so on. In that case, with respect to COVID, it's quite easy. You, don't, you just have to do like you do for the other ways. I, rem I remind you that uh, coronavirus uh, is not more uh, is, is not more resistant than most other viruses and bacteria. It will it will inactivate by itself uh, at, after some time and so on. So if you already have treatment means and a, ma and a management program that takes other biological waste into consideration, and if you are satisfied about that, then do the same thing with respect to COVID-19 waste. So that's why also I said that it's not it, it, waste is not a specific issue with respect to, to COVID-19 and coronavirus. Uh, so if you have a good system in place, just use it the same way with the coronavirus. You might be in a different situations where you have some treatment capacity, but it's it's limited. Uh, in that case, uh, there are things that could be improved. In case of limitation of treatment capacity, the best thing to do is to treat in priority the the most hazardous waste. And so you need to really think about the question and to do a kind of risk analysis and prioritize prioritize waste on the basis of risk. So if, for instance, if you have an, an institution where you already have very hazardous agents like tuberculosis, like uh, different agents that, uh, in, uh, like uh, pathogenic agents uh, that co cause uh, uh, big viral uh, disease and so on, in that case, uh, coronavirus is probably less hazardous and, and easier to, to inactivate. In that case, you might not give the priority to coronavirus. If, for instance, rural labs have only materials from different type of low risk, in that case, you might need to prioritize waste from coronavirus and have a specific waste streams for the coronavirus waste. We can discuss a little bit more about the, the options that, that could be uh, done in that case. Then, uh, in the third situation, there is no uh, suitable on-site treatment system. And then you need to consider a number of options. And of course, I don't know your facilities, I don't know your institution. And so that's where we need to, we need to think in some way uh, about, about the specific situation. Uh, a first possible option is, would be to improve or re rehabilitate treatment capabilities. So for instance, if you have some other places which are not in use, in that case, perhaps you should uh, can, uh, you could do some maintenance of those pieces of equipment and start to playing again. If you don't have, you might also have an incinerator which is not used because too expensive and so on. In that case, you could also uh, have some basic maintenance and then use it. If you are in a remote place, you could also do some burning. Okay. Then the second uh, option uh, you will you might find it's uh, it's a little bit strange. You could develop storage and waiting for real decay. If you don't have any real treatment capability. In that case, and it's a recommendation that is uh, in some official papers, I mean, uh, you, can, you can store your waste for a number of days and then have them removed so from, from your facilities. Uh, remember that principle of viral decay. The virus dies by itself very early and most of the virus after a few hours or days uh, are, have disappeared by themselves just because of drying out and so on. So in that case, you would wait for some time and then uh, have real waste collected. It's not an, an, uh, a real treatment process, but it, it can work and it can really reduce the risk uh, downstream. Then if you don't have any way, uh, way to do that or any way to treat the waste in any way, in that case, you need to, to make sure that the downstream pro process, all the downstream from collection to final destruction or, or disposal is safe. That means that you need to take care of pa uh, packaging, a good, a good packaging system. 
that you need to have uh, safety measures for collect and, uh, collecting and transport, that you need also to have uh, the waste handlers protected, meaning they have to wear some specific protective, uh, personal protective equipment. And then you need to also look at the final disposal and treatment. Those different options, they, they might, the way you interpret that might be different from one institution, uh, from one institution to the other, depending on what, what is already in place and depending on what, how you treat waste for the moment. One does not exclude the other. So even if you, if you have some treatment capabilities, for instance, but you're not totally sure, in that case, it would be perhaps good also to look at the uh, protection of the waste handlers. I saw some questions about that. Uh, they might be Ill illiterate and so on, but then it's not our responsibility to, to make sure that they, they understand that they are at risk and, 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 and that they, they need to be protected and provide that type of equipment. To, to finish the, this last section, I, I'll give you a few examples of, of, of things that might be inspiring for you and perhaps we will facilitate the discussion we'll have on Friday. So this is one uh, waste, uh, uh, one room for uh, for the temporary treat, uh, storage of waste bef before their collection. You see that it's a nice room, it's clean, it's uh, it's well in order and so on. There are a number of, of, of measures that we can take to have such a room in a, kept in a very good state. If you think about viral decay, for instance, you could have uh, rooms like this and really put the waste there uh, and, and then have them collected after, after some time. So that's, that's one approach. Example, uh, this one, oh yeah, it was taken in Pakistan. Those, these examples here are also from, from Pakistan uh, for on-site transport and in the three cases from three different institutions, you see that in each, even if they use bags with waste, they collect them and, and transport them and sometimes even store them in, uh, in trolleys, which are closed trolleys on wheels. It, it's very convenient. The risk of spill is, is extremely limited. And if even if some bag leaks inside of, of those containers, it's very easy to uh, decontaminate and clean after use in order to be reused. So this is the kind of, of thing that things that can be put in place. But then on the right, you see a collection for offsite transport, and you see that it's a, a closed truck, that there is some uh, enough room for the waste, and also that the person, the waste handler there is, is seems to be well protected. An example of, of very good waste uh, protection of waste handler, and again, this was uh, taken in, in Brunei Dar es Salaam. Uh, head cover, uh, a face mask, in this case, it's a respiratory face mask, a, a protective one, N95. Specific work clothes, so it's not the, the clothes that they, that person will wear when going back home. And also because there are the, the risk to have some spill when carrying the, the bags is, is uh, mainly the front face, uh, an impervious apron, every heavy duty gloves, use, it's useless to give them uh, laboratory gloves, they are not resistant enough, and also boots. Brunei, Brunei is a very hot country, so it's, it's the same situation in Pakistan, it's hot and humid, so, uh, and those people, they comply with, uh, with the, the obligation to be protected like that. So, this to, to illustrate uh, and perhaps to give some, some ideas of, of things that could be improved. So how will we proceed uh, in the future? So we already have many, many questions. If you have more questions that you want to address uh, in between, but please do it quite early, you can send them to the PEPSA office and please use the two addresses that are mentioned there. And then the proposed topics for discussions uh, and that I will see that according to the questions and might add someone. Uh, all the segregation issue, how to segregate uh, coronavirus contaminated waste from others and so on. There are a few questions about that. Then the classical and alternative on-site treatment option. Um, see which one would, could be more appropriate. We'll see if, how it's possible to improve them. Um, also a way to, sec ways to secure collection and transport. Personal protection for waste handling. Then also um, how to uh, to manage waste, contaminated waste, outside a hospital or laboratory setting. I saw at least one question about that. 
uh, like people at home, they also wear some protection, especially if there is a case of uh, a patient at home, and they might also have gloves and so on to, to get rid of. How should they do that? And then, of course, any other questions that would be related to this topic. Also, I noticed that in questions, there are a few questions that may not be really on the topic of waste. Uh, I'm not sure at all that we will be able to uh, answer those questions on Friday. But in that case, they will not be totally forgotten. We'll put them in some uh, uh, frequently asked questions and, and also provide some, some answer. So do you have any further questions, comments, or suggestions? Uh, Zia, can you manage this part, or, or Ziba? Uh, yes. <clears throat> So, our fourth or final uh, section of waste management key options pay uh, specially relevant to COVID uh, ke jo scenario. Mein. Jo aajkal hamare uh, do tarah ki facilities kam kar rahi hai, labs or healthcare setup ya hospitals. So, lab mein hamare pas sampling swabs or PCR tubes or personal protective equipments vagera jo hai, wo as a waste produce ho rahe hai. Or healthcare setup se jo patient hai, unke istemal ki cheeze aur baaki personal protective equipments generate ho rahi hai. Scenario one is that if you have a suitable biological waste management option already in place, we are doing it in routine. So, the COVID-19 waste that has been produced, you can manage it in the same way as biological waste. For this, you don't need any special sophisticated equipment or treatment. Scenario two is that if you have a limited capacity है waste को on site treat करने की तो आप risk assessment करें और अपने waste को risk की base पर prioritize कर लें तो definitely आजकल आजकल के scenario में जो covid का waste है उसको आप high priority पर रखते हुए पहले treat करें और बाकी सारे waste को दूसरे number पर treat कर सकते हैं scenario three आता है कि अगर आपके पास fully suitable on site facility नहीं है waste को manage करने की तो आप सोचें कि in sari options may se koi aapke paas option hai for example auto claiming ki option hai ya kya waste ko burn kar sakte hain ya ek kuch papers mein ye bhi aaya hai jis tarah dr philip ne bataya ke jo jo waste hai aap usko store kare aur virus ki decay hone ka intezar kare kyunki ye rna virus hai bahar zyada survive nahi karta to aisa aisa iski decay hona shuru ho jati hai lekin iske baad ye bahut zyada zaruri hai ke jo downstream process hai aapki packaging hai transport hai collection hai wo proper ho secured ho or till final disposment, which is your process secured. This is an example from Shokal Khanum Pishawar, that if you have a good waste storage, if you have to wait for viral decay, then this is a storage facility, which you can use, which is a dedicated room, which is proper ventilation, pest control, and light view is enough. These are examples of good waste practices, which are in Pakistan. ये आपके लेफ्ट हैंड साइड पे जो वेस्ट को ट्रांसपोर्ट करने के लिए क्लोज बिन्स हैं जो विद व्हील्स हैं ताकि उनको बंद करके एक जगह दूसरी जगह ट्रांसपोर्ट किया जा सके और राइट साइड पे एक वेस्ट कलेक्शन का ट्रक है जिसके अंदर वेस्ट हम रख के उसको अच्छी तरह से बंद करके ट्रांसपोर्ट कर सकते हैं उस ट्रक को बाद में डिकोन्टेमिनेट भी कर सकते हैं ये एक एग्जाम्पल है अच्छे वेस्ट हैंडलर की जो हमारे वेस्ट को हैंडल करेंगे उनके लिए ये अच्छी एग्जाम्पल है कि ये सारी चीजें हैं पर्सनल प्रोटेक्टिव इक्विपमेंट्स जो उसके पास होनी चाहिए हेड कवर हो N95 हो, उसके बाद जो डेडिकेटेड क्लॉस हैं और एप्रन हो जो पानी को रेजिस्टेंट हो या इनपवियस हो, उसके बाद हैवी ड्यूटी ग्लास और रबर कूट्स होने चाहिए। लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन, आज का हमारा सेक्शन यहाँ तक था। जो भी आज के सवाल हैं, वो फ्राइडे को हम एड्रेस करेंगे। जो सारी लिस्ट दी गई है, इन Okay, thank you everybody. I'm very much aware of the fact that it's seven minutes after six o'clock in the evening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Philippe, and thank you, Zia. On Friday of this week, uh, so just two days from now, we're going to have a session where mo we hope that uh, many of your questions will be answered if they have not been. And some of you have brought up the issue about uh, certificates or continuing education credits, and PEPSA and Fogarty will discuss that further. Um, so thank you very much for your participation and thank you to the presenters. Thank, that's all for now. Goodbye, everybody.
Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you very much for all the questions.